Well, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for listening to this gospel message. It's a privilege to be able to speak to you and it is our prayer that it will be a blessing. The gospel is a wonderful message. It's good for Christians. It reminds them of the greatness of their salvation and it points them to their savior. But it's also a wonderful message for those who are still in their sins. And it provides an opportunity to find forgiveness and life through the Lord Jesus. And so we thank you for joining us tonight. I want to read three verses from the Holy Scriptures. The first two are found in the book of Romans chapter 5. And I'll read them carefully for you. Romans chapter 5 and beginning with verse number 8. Romans chapter 5. And verse number eight, but God commendeth. That's an old fashioned word that means that God demonstrates or God shows his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you have a Bible, lift your eyes to verse number six, Romans chapter five and verse number six. For when we were yet without strength, in other words, when we were powerless, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Our third and final reading is in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to begin reading at verse number three. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number three. This is the Apostle Paul writing and defining what the gospel, the good news, is. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. And that's all I want to read, and I trust God will uh, bless the reading of his word, together with some little comments that I want to make about it. Last week, I was uh, traveling with my wife in northern Michigan. Uh, for those of you who live on the East Coast, the northern part of Michigan is... Uh, is very rustic. It's a vacation uh, paradise. Uh, it's wooded, uh, large lakes, and of course the Great Lakes. And there are many people who flood to the north uh, to enjoy uh, their summer vacation there. As my wife and I were driving along, um, we saw something that I don't think I have ever seen before. There was a large campground. And it was filled with, especially with young people. And there were tents and campers and trailers and a, a very large campground where people were enjoying their summer vacation. What was remarkable about it was this, that on the edge of the large campground was a large cemetery. I, I've never seen those two things put together. It was an odd juxtaposition hundreds and hundreds of tents and campers and trailers, and then hundreds and thousands of headstones and markers in that cemetery filled with the graves of people that had gone on to eternity. As I thought about what I saw there, I thought that maybe it didn't make the devil all that happy. The devil is interested in keeping us involved with entertainment, things to make us happy things to make us forget serious things, things that uh, cause us to uh, not think about the future or eternity. And yet here in the very scenes of people's pleasure was a stark reminder that all of us are going to die. God has filled the world with reminders. Every obituary reminds us that we're going to die. Every funeral that we uh, attend reminds us that that is our ultimate destination. And every cemetery, like the one I saw, uh, reminds us 
that death is, is all around us. We live, dear friend, in a world that is filled with death, and it is the end that lies ahead of every one of us. And whether that death is because of a virus or because of an accident or because of an overdose, or whether it is just something as simple as old age, we need to be reminded that all of us are moving toward eternity. What I have read in these verses tonight is something that is quite unique. Because three times over, I read not about the death of humans as the result of sin, but we read that Christ died. Each of these verses uses precisely the same language. Christ died, Christ died, Christ died. And each of them has a unique focus. We, we learned first of all that uh, the death of Christ was because of what we have done, because we are sinners. The death of Christ, secondly, reflects on what we cannot do, because when we were powerless, that is when Christ died. And finally, it is the answer to our deepest need. It is the gospel. It is the good news that Christ died for our sins and was buried and raised again the third day. And so I want to spend a little time talking with you, not about our death, but about the death of Christ. And in order to understand the death of Christ, to talk a little about the one who died. I love to tell people about the Lord Jesus because that really is what lies at the center of the gospel. I, I don't judge other gospel preachers, but I will say this, that if a message is given that does not have Christ at the center, no matter what else is preached, it's not the gospel. When Christ is preached, when his glorious person is presented, and when the wonder of his death and the value of his death is set forth to the world, you may be sure that that is the good news of the gospel. I want to think about some things about the Lord Jesus tonight, and they're very simple. And I hope you'll follow along with me as we consider them together. I want you to think about the Lord Jesus as the one who stepped down into our world. This is the most remarkable story that I know, that heaven's majestic son, the son of God, actually chose to visit our world. You know, there are times that we have visitors, perhaps uh, 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 a, a king or a queen may visit our shores, a prime minister or someone of great significance. And of course, that's an occasion uh, for great public interest because we've, we've been visited by these extraordinary people. I want you to think tonight about the Lord Jesus, the one who stooped to come in to our world. You know, the Apostle Paul, and we've been reading some things that he wrote tonight, he, he spoke about this uh, great coming. He, he said that though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor. There is no greater story of a man who stepped down than the story of the Son of God, who stepped into humanity and stepped into our world. You know, one of the great themes of Western society, at least, is the idea of upward mobility. We, we are accustomed to thinking that through dint of hard work and determination and a dogged will, that we can better ourselves. Many of us have earned more money than our parents, for example. Many of us live in nicer or larger homes than our forefathers. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is just the normal course of society, normally. Uh, and so we think about stepping up and improving ourselves uh, so that we might enjoy uh, greater things in this world. How extraordinary then is the story of Jesus Christ. The man who didn't strive to be higher, actually that was an impossibility, for in heaven he could not be higher. He was the greatest and the highest and the most exalted of all. And yet tonight we'd love to tell you about the fact that in grace he stepped down and became a man so that Christ might die. Very often we sing the words of that beautiful hymn. Many of you know it. 
down from the glory, the Savior came down to the cross and the death of shame. Gazing in wonder, I there exclaim, Jesus died for me. And so I want you to just ponder for a minute as we begin our message about the one who was eternal spirit and yet became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. About the one who was invisible, a spirit, and yet became visible as the child, as the teenager, as the man who moved to Calvary. And I want you to think about the one who was deathless and who was immortal. But by this stoop, he became able to die. It is because of the incarnation. It is because of this mighty stoop that we are able to read Christ died. And so think with me, first of all, about the one who stooped, who stepped into our world. I want you to think, secondly, about the one who was scorned. Normally, when we are visited, as I have been alluding to, by a famous person, by some dignitary, or some person that is of note, they are usually met with acclaim. Uh, it may be genuine, it may be worked up, but nonetheless, when we have a visitor, it is customary to treat them with grace and with kindness, and perhaps even with applause. But I want you to think about how the Lord Jesus came into our world. This is what the Bible tells us. He was despised. I, I, want, I want you to be shocked, actually. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. I, I, I am staggered by this. The one who came on the great rescue mission from heaven. The one who came so that we might proclaim Christ died for the ungodly. Was not welcomed. He was scorned. Listen to his own words. I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by mankind and despised by the people. And you know, the remarkable thing is, is that that scorn followed him all the way through his life. When we come to the cross, we discovered that there are thieves that mock him. And there are others who scorned him. He saved others himself. He cannot save. Let me just pause for a minute and ask you a very personal question. What value do you place on the person of the Lord Jesus tonight? Is he someone that you embrace? Is his name a welcome name? Is his message a message that draws your heart? Is his salvation something that piques your interest? Or is he to you as he was to the world in his own day? He came unto his own and his own received him not. You know, a man told me something a few years ago I've never forgotten. I think I had a gospel series with him in Midland Park one time. He said this when I was just a boy. He said, if the Lord Jesus came back to the world today, he would be treated exactly the same way as he was the first time. I can remember hearing him say that. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, that isn't possible, really. But we've made so many advances in 2000 years. Certainly civilization has grown. Society has matured. They, they wouldn't do that to the Lord Jesus. I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm working on being an old man. But here's the thing. If the Lord Jesus came to our world again tonight, he would be treated exactly the same way. His name is still used as a byword and as a curse. His work is diminished and ignored by the world at large. The name of Jesus and the work of Jesus have little value to a pleasure mad world. Let me ask you tonight, what do you think about Christ? Because I want to tell you that what you think about him will actually determine your eternal destiny. But I want to tell you not only about the one who stooped, who stepped into our world, and the one who was scorned, shockingly so, 
the savior, and yet he was rejected. But I want to tell you about the one who was smitten. I know the word smitten might not be a word that you use on a regular basis, but to smite someone is to strike them. It is to, it is to strike a blow against them. And it reminds me of what the Bible says about the one who is smitten. You know, there was a man in the Old Testament and he was smitten. His name was Job and he was smitten by Satan. And as a result of that, his possessions were ripped away from him. His family uh, died under terrible circumstances. His health was removed and he was reduced to the lowest possible pit that earth could imagine, smitten by Satan. But I want to tell you about a man that was smitten by God because Isaiah 53 tells us about the Lord Jesus. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God. Why was that? Well, the text goes on to say he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. You know, I love to think about and I love to preach about the cross. And one of the things that we must be very careful of when we speak about the cross is that we keep our focus on the right smiting. Let me see if I can explain that. You know, there are things about the cross that are visual. They are external. And as a matter of fact, in some small way, they are understandable. The Lord Jesus was terribly smitten by men. But I can imagine the terrible pain of thorns pressed into his brow. I can imagine in a small way what it must have been to be struck upon the face. I can imagine perhaps a little of what it was to be thirsty, uh, to be abandoned. These are things that are external and things that we can, at least in some small way, visualize. But I want to tell you tonight is about the smiting of God that took place, not on the outside, but that took place in his soul. It was God's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. It was the suffering of his soul in a place that no man can see, that no eye can discern that no imagination can possibly conceive. And in those dark hours of Calvary, when Christ died, he was smitten of God and afflicted. I want to tell you that that was not because of any fault of his own. That's the glorious story of the gospel, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. It was our sin that occasioned his death. It was our sin that brought him into deep sorrow. And yet as our substitute, he bore that in our place. I love the words of the hymn writer, because the sinless savior died, my sinful soul is counted free and God the just is satisfied to look on Christ and pardon me. You know, there's not anything very satisfactory about the death of human beings. It brings about grief and tears and loss and sorrow and mourning. And yet in the death of Christ, there is a great victory that has been won. The heart of God has been satisfied. All that he required, all that justice demanded was fully found in the death of Christ. Christ died. And so I want you to think about the one who stepped down and the one who was mocked and scorned. I want you to remember the one who is smitten of God and afflicted. And as the great burden of our sin was laid upon him, the Lord Jesus suffered as our substitute. But I want to tell you, fourthly, not only about the one who is smitten, but I want to tell you about the one who saves. You know, there's a, a word that is found in every gospel message. I, I can't imagine preaching the gospel without employing it. And that is the word save or saved or savior. Let me tell you tonight that because of Calvary, Christ is the one 
who is able to save sinners. You know, we are surrounded, and I'm really sad to say they are um, being discounted and being abused in some ways at this time. But we're surrounded by very brave men and women, policemen and firemen, and uh, ambulance drivers and emergency room doctors. And uh, their mission in life is to rescue and to deliver and to save. And those stories are often swept away in the news of the day. But I want to tell you, those are my heroes, at least. I'm so grateful that they are there to save those who are in need. What a wonderful thing, then, to tell you about the Lord Jesus, the one who met me in my deepest need and came to save me, not to save me from a burning building, not to save me from drowning in some lake or some ocean, but someone who came to save me from my sins and to save me from perishing eternally. May I ask you a question tonight? Would you like to be saved? Would you like to be rescued from your sins? Let me tell you tonight, Christ wants to save you. How can I measure how much he wants to save you? I love the words of Romans 5. My two children were both saved through this great truth. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love the cross tonight. And I love the man who died upon the cross. Because there was a day just when I was a little boy, eight years old, and he saved me. I love the words of Titus 3, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Oh, the death of Christ, all that it means to God, all that it means to saved sinners, all that it could mean to you if you would only trust him. There's one last thing that I want to talk about before I bring my little message to a close. The unique man who died at Calvary was the one who stepped down. He stooped. He was the one who was scorned. He wasn't received and welcomed. He was abused and rejected. He was the one who was smitten of God and afflicted. He suffered for sin in his own body on the tree. And he's the one tonight who can save, who can rescue sinners, who depend on him. Here's the last one. And um, I, I added this at the last minute. I added this about 15 or 20 minutes before I started to speak because I thought that the gospel message would not be complete without it. He's not only the one who is smitten, he's not only the one who can save, he is the one who can satisfy. You know, I, 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 it's a grand thing to be saved. We sang that just as little children. It's a grand thing to be saved. It's a grand thing to be saved and to know it too and to show it too. It's a grand thing to be saved. There's no blessing like God's salvation. It is not merely that God's salvation and the death of Christ are merely a fire escape from hell. No, no, dear friend. He, he saves us. He embraces us. He accepts us. He fills us with his presence. He fills us with his blessing. He fills us with hope of life eternal. Oh, what a savior. Oh, how he satisfies. You know, I love the words of the old hymn. Now none but Christ can satisfy. No other name for me. There's love and joy and lasting peace. Lord Jesus found in thee. You know, there might be somebody that's watching. And maybe you've tried to be satisfied in other ways. But you know, the satisfaction of earth, the pleasures of this world, they so quickly run away from us and, and, and we find ourselves dissatisfied again. I want to tell you that Christ satisfies and he satisfies permanently. I heard something that Billy Graham said many years ago, and it's something that has always stuck with me. He said, a person who receives God's salvation never regrets it for a single moment. I've been saved for almost 60 years. I can tell you personally, I've never regretted it for a single moment. And if you would trust Christ tonight, you would discover the truth of it for yourself. He's the one that can satisfy 
the longing heart. He's the one that can give you peace and forgiveness and eternal life. And so it's my desire tonight that is if we have read these little verses about the death of Christ and we have sought to explain the glory of the one who died and the value of the work that he performed. May God help you tonight just simply in the quietness of your own heart to receive him, to depend on him, to value him and to depend on the wonderful work that he completed when Christ died. May God bless you and bless his word to every heart. Shall we pray?